it's uh, thank you all for being here. Um, what we are doing today is kind of a virtual version of what we did, of something we started last year. And um, we really want to try to uh, provide an opportunity for the, for the public to uh, interact with and uh, learn about some of the research programs and, and art and writing programs that happen here at the Institute. And so last year we had this uh, 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 an opportunity for folks to come out. We actually went and did a little hike and visited researchers and, and some of the artists and writers and interns all in the field. Um, this year, just because of COVID, we can't do that. So what we, we thought we would try to do is, is bring, um, uh, bring those folks to you uh, and to do that uh, through the, through a series of videos. And so we asked the uh, researchers to put together a short video that um, introduces them as well as their project. Um, uh, most of these are taken out in the field or in a studio or uh, something like that. And so uh, it's an opportunity to actually see them doing their work. Um, it's going to be a lot faster. Last year, you know, it required a couple hours of walking around to visit everyone. Uh, this year, you can just sit in your chair and uh, you're brought immediately to the various places that uh, these folks are, are doing their work and get to see uh, get to see a lot of things up close. Um, <clears throat> I guess one other thing that I want to mention is that, uh, and I'll, I'll try to reiterate this uh, later, is that um, uh, the Institute depends and uh, 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 it depends on the support of members and individuals to help make these type of opportunities uh, um, uh, happen for these students. And so uh, we really appreciate the support that many of you and um, some specific individuals have, uh, have made to, to actually make this possible for us to have, have these students out here. And so we just wanna, uh, uh, again, say a thank you. Um, if you haven't support, supported the Institute in the past, um, but I, uh, you know, you're inspired and encouraged by the type of work that's being done. Uh, I guess I would just encourage you to, to support the Institute. That oh, looks like we have, have that. We'll, we'll come back to that again at the end of the program. So thank you, Alan. Um, so I, I guess without further ado, I'd like to start uh, by showing our research video. Um, our researcher, res we've had researchers out since 2005. So this is actually, I believe, our 16th year of having a, a research program. Um, this year we have um, a total of 19 students out. Um, we have, uh, I believe it's five different uh, research projects and you'll get to hear from uh, students from each of, those, each of those different research projects. Uh, so Ellen, do you mind? starting that video. Hello, my name is Megan Nippa. I'm a senior at Western Michigan University. Um, my faculty mentor, Dr. Katherine Doherty, and I are doing an experiment with the plant white indigo, which is right here next to me. Um, this is a late successional plant species, and it is known to form mutualisms in the soil with the soil microbial organisms. So um, the goal of our experiment is to uh, kind of figure out which different environmental variables affects this plant's ability to establish in these ecosystems, specifically the mutualisms that it forms in the soil. So right now we're at the stage where we're just kind of locating all the plants. Um, we've contacted various land managers across the state and they've given us uh, places that we can find them. So right now we're just going through the fields and recording the coordinates of all these plants that you would see. Um, so for example, this plant, I would just stand over it and find the coordinates. And for example, it's 42.25 degrees north and 85.64 degrees west. So I would just write that down and then after I go home, I will make a map of the entire field so I can see where in the field they are located. And then um, probably next week we'll start sampling and just we're going to take soil cores next to the plant to figure out um, we can identify the different soil microbial organisms that are located there. And then we'll also take some soil samples from areas that aren't associated with the plant so we can compare those samples to see if there's commonalities across the samples that were taken from the plant so we can see which um, maybe microbial organisms tend to associate with the plant the most what the soil might be like that they exist in and then hopefully uh, by the end of this project we'll have more information that will be able to help land managers um, better implement this plant in their uh, area. Hi guys, my name is Michaela Corey and I'm a graduate student at Grand Valley State University working with Dr. Jennifer Moore and Paul Keenlance 
on a spotted turtle, sur spotted turtle survey working on their spatial ecology and their survival um, estimates within this certain population in uh, Barry County. Um, I am going to be talking about today about how to identify a male versus a female turtle. Here with me today I have a female spotted turtle. Um, one way we can tell is by their nails. The females will have a lot shorter nails than the males were. With spotted turtles, their eye colors are also different as well. Females will have more of a yellow iris, whereas a male will have a darker iris um, and more brown. Another way to tell is underneath, this is their underside is called a plastron. And with female turtles, their plastron will be more um, pushed out and flat, whereas a males will be more concave because they don't need to hold eggs. And lastly, uh, the, all turtles have an opening called a cloaca, and the female's cloaca will only end right at the posterior end of her shell, whereas the males will extend further out. So these guys are pretty special because they're threatened in the state of Michigan and are actually proposed on the endangered species list by the U.S. Fisheries and Wildlife. And what we can do to protect them is to watch for turtles on the road in early June, um, to advocate turtle conservation, and be mindful when we're uh, buying pets to not buy any spotted turtles from the pet trade and or make sure that they are captively bred and not from the wild. So thanks so much. Hi everyone. So just as a reminder, my partner Ethan and I are working on wild rice this summer and we will be looking at how water quality and soil chemistry is affecting the growth of the wild rice. So we will be traveling to several different lakes um, throughout the Lower Peninsula and some rivers, um, as well as Cedar Creek, which is on the property. So we are just getting started on our project. I'm really excited to start and yeah, looking forward to uh, keeping you guys updated. Hello everybody, this is our first trip out on Cedar Creek. And yeah, I feel like uh, it's going well. Um, here's Ethan. <laughs> Heck yeah. And um, yeah, we are currently just uh, trying to get out to where the rice bed is and we're gonna test out some YSI stuff and Ethan's gonna test out um, getting some soil samples from over there. So yeah, all right. So we're at the rice. Um, the Zazania species is right here. Uh, this stalk right here is where the actual rice seeds are, and then this green part is also part of the plant. Uh, we're at Pure Cedar Creek right now. This is our first site, and we're doing great. So this is our Ekman dredge. Uh, the way it works is these weights right here help this dredge sink to the bottom, and when you drop it in, it hits hard, this trigger releases. When you pull it up, it closes and grabs our soil sample. So we're gonna try it for the first time and see how this works. <laughs> go Ethan. <laughs> there we go. Okay. <laughs> and I got it. There's our Woo! sample. Gross. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a YSI probe and we're using it to measure a ton of different stuff in the water. Right now we have four different probes on or connected to YSI. Let me show you. So we have a conductivity and temperature probe, a nitrate probe, an ammonium probe, and a DO probe. So by putting like it in the water, we can measure all of them at once, which is pretty cool. So really all you do is like all of the readings come up on here and you just drop it in the water and wait for it to kind of stabilize and that's it. So right now what we're doing is we're preparing a soil solution so we can test for uh, phosphorus, pH, nitrogen, etc. Um, and how we do that is by putting some of this universal extracting solution in with our soil, and then that solution pulls out all of the uh, components that we want to be looking at. Hey 
Here we go. Sorry, guys. Hello, my name is Josh Arnold. I am a graduate student at Grand Valley State University, and today I'll be talking to you about my project, Assessing the Short-Term Effects of Translocation on Freshwater Mussels. Is habitat or water quality more important? As previously stated, I am a current graduate student at Grand Valley State University, where I am pursuing my master's in aquatic science. I graduated from Indiana University of Pennsylvania in 2017 with a degree in ecology and a minor in geography. After graduating from IUP, I worked for the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission for two years as a wildlife and fisheries technician, where my work mostly dealt with native and wild trout, timber rattlesnakes, and freshwater mussels. For some background information on freshwater mussels, North America is widely considered to be the global biodiversity hotspot for freshwater mussels. This means that there are more native species of mussels here than anywhere else on the globe. Uh, there are roughly 300 species native to North America, with Michigan having 45 native species alone. This is compared to Europe's 11 native species. Unfortunately, mussels are considered to be the most imperiled group of animals in North America, with roughly 70% of all native mussel species being listed at either the state or federal level. In addition, at least 30 species have gone extinct in the past 150 years alone. This dramatic decline of native mussels can be contributed to over-exploitation for freshwater pearls and buttons, uh, wide-scale habitat alteration in the form of dams and channelization, and the introduction of invasive species such as zebra mussels and round goby. A commonly used management practice to help conserve our remaining mussel populations is translocation. Translocation is the act of moving a population of individuals from one location to another, usually used when that population is threatened with extirpation or localized extinction. This is often due to human impacts such as bridge removal or dam removal in some cases. Uh, translocation has been used for a long time since the early 1900s and has a varying level of success with some instances having greater than 90% of mussels surviving the translocation process for up to five years afterwards, and in some cases, 100% of the mussels dying during the, the process. My project at Pierce Cedar Creek Institute is to look at the short-term effects of translocation on freshwater mussels using changes in growth, mortality, and reproductive success as measures on the overall health of, of translocated individuals. In addition, we'll be looking at how differences in habitat and water quality from the source site to new sites can affect the success of translocation. In order to do this project, we will be collecting mussels from the thorn apple watershed and moving them to various sites throughout the watershed. These sites will have varying levels of similarities and differences in both habitat and water quality from the source site. The overall goal of this project is to further improve translocation protocol here in Michigan and hopefully in other states. In addition, another part of this project is to raise awareness of freshwater mussels and their plight by participating in events such as this today. Thank you for your time and for coming to today's event. If you have any more questions, please feel free to contact me at the email address listed below. Thank you. Hi, my name is Andrew Bannertag. I'm the other research partner with Nathan Wilkes and Professor Dornboss um, on the Multiflora Rose Project. Um, just a little bit about our instruments that we use for the, in the field. Um, here is our chlorophyll measurement. Um, and so it's as simple as just going on. And we take three readings per plant. Um, and then this is the main instrument we use. It's a Lycor 6400. Um, basically, it measures how much photosynthesis um, each plant is putting out or each leaf. And we can control um, exactly how much light it's getting. So we find the leaf that we like. Uh, we put it right here in the chamber and we close it down and as you can see we get photosynthesis rates, we get carbon rates um, as well as water and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, there's our project. Thanks for joining us today. Hello, my name is Nathan Wilkes and I'm working with Professor Dornboss and Andrew Vanderteig on the invasive species Multiflora rose. This is a Multiflora rose plant right here. You can tell by its petiole length and the amount of petioles you normally see with the leaves like this. And its velcro bottom with spikes all over it. We're taking this plant and comparing it to other native species, such as black cherry, which is recognizable by its bark. And we're using these leaves down here since we can't reach the leaves up there. And then 
for a third replicate. We're using Virginia creeper since it grows basically everywhere in the forests and meadows and old forests, which are three locations that we'll be sampling from. We're planning to do six replicates multiple times throughout the summer to in order to figure out what the competitive advantage of multiflora rose is. Okay. Hi, my name is Faith. Hi, my name is Megan. And we go to Grand Valley State University. And this summer we've been working on a project involving eastern box turtles. One part of our project involves monitoring nine eastern box turtles that were head started at John Ball Zoo this past winter. Head starting is a process in which baby turtles are briefly raised in captivity before being released into the wild. Baby turtles tend to be vulnerable and typically have low survival rates, so raising the turtles in a safe environment for the first few months of their life allows them to grow bigger and be healthier than wild turtles would be. That way, they have a better chance of making it when they are released. We used epoxy glue to attach radio transmitters to the shell of each turtle. These transmitters are very light, so they do not harm the turtles or affect their movement. Each transmitter gives off a unique radio signal that allows us to easily relocate the turtles whenever we need to, to track their movements and check up on them. After the transmitters were attached, we released the turtles along a forest edge on the property that seems to provide ideal habitat for them. We have been checking up on them every day since then to track their progress and see how they are doing. The other part of our project involves protecting eastern box turtle nests. Many turtle populations have been declining in recent years, and one of the main factors contributing to that is nest predation. In order to increase the eastern box turtle population at Pierce Cedar Creek, we are working to protect nests to prevent predation and increase the abundance of this species. A few employees from John Ball Zoo were nice enough to come out and examine our female box turtles earlier this spring. They did physical exams to check on the general health of each turtle. They also did x-rays, which allowed us to see which turtles were carrying eggs and how many eggs each turtle had. One tool we have been using to relocate our box turtles is called radio telemetry. As we mentioned earlier, the transmitters that we attach to each turtle's shell give off a specific radio frequency. Using our radio telemetry equipment, we are able to pick up that signal and follow the sound until we locate each turtle. <laughs> Eastern box turtles typically nest in early June, so we have been going out every evening to relocate the female turtles using radio telemetry. Once we find a turtle, we check to see if it is digging a nest. If it is, we wait until it has laid its eggs. When the turtle has finished its nest, we place a nest exclosure over it to protect it. We buried the exclosure approximately six inches into the ground to prevent nest predators from digging up the eggs. So far, we have been able to protect eight eastern box turtle nests. Yeah. All right. Very good. Um, yeah. So uh, I, I, we we had we had these updates. Now's now's your chance to kind of ask some ask some questions uh, to some of these folks. Um, I guess uh, here there we go. <laughs> um, maybe a question for um, our researchers. Oh, okay. Here we go. Uh, Sarah sent in a question. Um, how old are the box turtle adults? Can I, I, Faith and Megan, can you uh, give us some insight into that? Yeah, for sure. So we have 17 different adults right now. And so there's kind of a wide range of ages. So the youngest one that we found seems to be around 11 years old. And then we have one that is old enough that we can't accurately age it. So a lot of them tend to be in the late teens or mid twenties, but there is quite a variation in the age. And how, how long can box turtles live? A really long time. So 50 years is probably a good average, but if they're in good health and a good habitat, it could go for much longer than that. 
this is a question that came in uh, for anyone. How did you decide on your research topic? Um, well, personally, I first did rattlesnakes last summer and I thought it was a good introduction to research um, just for grad school experience. And then that same professor brought me onto this project and this is Faith's second year on it. And I really enjoy um, herpetology and just studying more with turtles. Uh, that's kind of the same story with me. I uh, reached out to my professor because I was interested in doing some uh, plant research this summer and that's how I kind of landed on the wild rice project. Here we can say something then quick too. Um, personally, I think that we chose it because uh, like... Grayson, can you give us just one second? Whoever else on the panelists is not speaking at the time, if you can mute your microphone so we do not get the feedback, that would be great. Thank you. Sorry, Grayson. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm Andrew, by the way. Um, we're borrowing your laptop. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, anyways, I think, like Megan said, it's really good experience um, to get your feet wet in the research field um, either way. And so this is a professor that we had a good relationship with. And so... Um, both of us decided to just kind of our first run at it. Um, and so plant or animal, uh, we thought it'd be a good opportunity. Okay, um, we did have a question um, on the box, or well, actually I shouldn't, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Maybe a few of you more can answer that question as well. Um, I was just gonna say additionally to my answer that I really, like I didn't I don't know exactly what I want to do with my career in the future but I know that an important aspect for me was working with conservation so with both projects they are threatened species and I really wanted to work towards protecting them and re-establishing their population so that was an important thing for me to pick this project. Okay so we had a question uh, on Facebook Live, as well as a question in the chat box uh, about the mussel projects. Um, one person didn't know that freshwater pearls came from mussels. Um, this was the statement that they had. And another person was saying, for the mussel pr project, have they had good luck finding, oops, sorry, it moved on me for a second. Did they have good luck finding enough mussels to move? Okay. I, um, uh, uh, Josh isn't in on this conversation, um, so uh, I can maybe talk a little bit about it, but uh, freshwater mussels uh, can, um, can produce pearls, so there are freshwater pearls, um, but uh, the primary reason that they were harvested was not actually the, the pearls themselves, uh, you know, you, you can get lucky and find them, but it was actually the mother of pearl, and so I, uh, um, uh, the, the muscles were collected and then they had these stamping or presses and you would just press out buttons. Um, and so you might have seen like uh, buttons that uh, um, back in the day, instead of being made out of plastic, like they, they typically are today, they would have actually used muscle shells as, uh, as a source for them. Um, you know, if you get like one of those Western shirts with the snaps on them or, or something like that. You might also get some uh, perloid uh, uh, button snaps. Uh, so those are the types of, of things that, that they were using. They, these were very big, big operations, even in Michigan and on the Grand River, I know of some, where you had lots of mussels and they were collected extensively, um, specifically to, 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 for the shells to create buttons. Um, much less so now in part because there's fewer mussels and because we use plastic uh, for the most part. Um, on the, the number of mussels, I haven't talked to Josh, to, to, so I don't know exactly what's going on um, with, uh, uh, if he's been able to find enough um, uh, for, for transferring. And so uh, it's something we'll have to check in and get a little update from him specifically on. Great. Um, for the box turtle project, there was a question. Uh, with the box turtle nests at any point, if they are being threatened, would you take the eggs from the nest and move it slash raise them elsewhere? 
Yeah, so the whole point of protecting the nests is so that we can leave them out in the field that way. And the exclosures that we put on do a really good job of protecting them. They were successful last year. And so far this year, nothing's been able to get in to harm the eggs. Um, there are groups that have done incubation with turtle eggs where you would dig them up and, and raise them inside. And that's definitely an avenue that could be explored with a project like this, but it's not something that we're currently doing. Uh, we had a question about the wild rice project. I believe, yes, we do have the people that study wild rice on this call. Uh, when does wild rice go to seed and what type of animals eat it? Um, it normally goes to seed around the end of July, or, but I'm not actually, actually sure what type of animals do eat it. I know that it's been a yeah. big cultural staple for uh, the Anishinaabe culture in Michigan for many, many, I mean, hundreds of years. Um, That's one of the biggest reasons why we are researching it, because it's so important to the tribes. So. Yeah, um, and a lot of the old beds have kind of disappeared within the last 40 years, so it's an important restoration effort. Awesome. All right. And then I see a couple more questions. Uh, for the Spotted Turtle Project, uh, have they been able to find many turtles and what kind of habitat do they seem to prefer? Does my uh, microphone work? Yes. Okay. Sorry, I just got out of my field right now, so I've been listening to this while I've been uh, doing some field work, so I'm just sitting in my car not to get eaten by mosquitoes right now. <laughs> um, but right now, actually, surprisingly, we found quite a bit of spotted turtles. Um, I can't really disclose the location, um, unfortunately, because of their current threatened status. But uh, fortunately, we have been finding quite a bit, a lot of a new population, too. Um, I've been doing a study compared to a study done about 10 years ago, comparing a survival estimates. And right now, I've seen about probably 30 or 30 more that are new, which is fantastic. Um, and that's probably lowballing it, which is it's great. Um, the population is about, I would say, 80. And uh, in uh, regards to habitat pre preference, they, it depends on what uh, season they're in, such as nesting, they're migrating, mating. Um, but overall, they like a lot of marshland fens, which uh, has a lot of peat and sphagnum moss. They have a lot of sedges, places where they can go and hide and prevent themselves from drying out, also known as desiccation. They also really like uh, ephemeral pools or just pools in general. And you'll see them congregating there, especially when things are uh, a little bit hot and they need a place to cool off, but they also need a place to bask. Um, for most of the reasons, uh, m most of the areas, though, are, you would include like fens, bogs, um, and then upland forests. And that's the kind of habitat that they prefer. So, yeah. <laughs> Great. And we have one more question that I see in the chat box. Um, Emma wants to know if the folks working on Multiflora Rose have encountered any bears. As of right now, we haven't seen any bears in the field, so sadly no. Probably a good thing overall. Uh, Matt, that's all the questions we have right now for the researchers. Do we want to right. continue on maybe? Let's, uh, let's go ahead and do that. Uh, we'll move on to the art and writing. Uh -huh.